Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Smith. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving here at Columbia. And I'm so thrilled you all were able to come and join us this evening for Creativity, Philosophy Meets Hollywood. We are thrilled tonight to have two great creative minds in our midst, brothers Dan and Stephen Asma, who will share with us how creativity can be a part of any career path. Dan is an alumnus of Columbia, graduating in the class of 1992. He's had a successful career in Hollywood and is currently the co-owner of Buddha Jones, an award-winning marketing agency known for their work promoting films such as Django Unchained, Gravity, and The Martian. Stephen Asma is a professor of philosophy at Columbia and a writer for the New York Times. He's the author of 10 books, including Buddha for Beginners, Against Fairness, and On Monsters. Please join me in welcoming Dan and Stephen Asma. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, thank you to Miriam and all the folks at the uh, alumni office for arranging things and setting up the, the various, uh, <clears throat> you know, machinery for this event. Um, I'm Steve Asma. This is my brother, Dan. And um, the way we're going to do this is sort of tag team the presentation, where I'll probably talk a little bit more at the beginning. He's going to sort of fill out the middle section with a lot of examples from uh, these creative trailers that he does at his, his company. And then we'll kind of mix it up. Um, at the end, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards, which is usually the sort of high point. Um, so what I thought we'd do is talk a little bit about, I might do a little walking around here because I, one of you punk uh, students put your gun on my seat here and it ended up on my pants. So just so you know. All right, so we're gonna talk about creativity and I'm gonna give you sort of a sense of what we're learning about the brain um, and from psychology and from philosophy and from neuroscience, and then Dan's going to show some great uh, examples of it. There's a kind of a long-standing debate um, amongst uh, theorists that uh, creativity is either a kind of divine inspiration, some muse comes into you and works through you. Uh, that view dates all the way back to the ancient Greeks, and it's like a sort of a possession, benign possession by uh, like a happy uh, spirit. And it gets you to make the great painting or the great poem or whatever it is. And then that is usually contrasted with the grinder theory, which is you basically just put in 10,000 hours on whatever it is. And this has been made pretty famous by Malcolm Gladwell recently. Um, maybe you're not particularly talented uh, at something naturally or, or uh, innately, but if you just work at it long enough. And it, the example he gave was, he gave several examples, but this one I kind of like. A lot of people think, oh, well, when you mix McCartney and Lennon together, you get this sort of creative, magical, mystical moment. And that's great, but he pointed out that these guys worked as essentially a, a house band at a strip club in Germany for like, you know, years <laughs> in Hamburg and uh, before anybody ever really heard them. And so they, they did their 10,000 hours and ended up d developing these great creative skills. What we're going to argue here today is a little bit of both. We're going to show some of the stuff that's really intuitive and almost almost mystical. Um, I, th I think it's natural and not supernatural. But uh, and then also what some of the hard work is. So let's start with the some of the brain myths. This is one that's very well known, which is the left brain right brain um, stereotype. Have you guys heard of this? You're either left brain or right brain. There doesn't appear to be much actual evidence for this view. Uh, this appears to be false. There are things that are located on the left and things that are located on the right brain, but we don't sort of uh, come packaged as one or the other. Uh, I love this image because you've got such a great character of uh, this kind of rational, working in a cubicle, accounting mind versus the, what's that? No, yeah, no, yeah, no one wants to be there. They get things done. Uh, but um, no one really wants to be there. And then you've got this sort of Columbia College vibe on the right. <laughs> Everyone's making films and, and meditating and playing guitar. Uh, so this is not actually how it works. Um, but so I'm going to explain to you what we think really is happening in the brain. So I'm going to tell you just a couple of 
systems that we've been learning about more recently in brain science. This is the idea of the triune brain. Um, as uh, many of you know, you've got this kind of reptile brain. That's the old brain. We share that with all vertebrates. And that handles stuff like uh, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, nutrition, the drive for food, thirst. Um, this is basically the, the brain stem and sub subcortical areas. And then wrapped around that area is the limbic brain, or, which is primarily where your emotions are, reside and memory. And then the very large part for humans is the neocortex, and that's the part that's all folded and that's, that you see from the outside. And of course, in human beings, it's massive. It's just huge compared to other animals. And it evolved very quickly in human beings. Now, what you're gonna find is that uh, Dan's gonna show you some trailers and some, uh, some artwork, and whenever you're telling a story, you're engaging all these parts of the brain, a particularly a good story. Bad, bad stories, I think. Uh, you know, fail at engaging the whole brain. But let's look at this br very briefly. This is sort of a, um, not a cutaway, but you can see through the neocortex to the limbic system. And you'll see some things that are familiar, like the amygdala is that little sort of um, almond-shaped organ. You see that brown one there? And that, which you have in both hemispheres, is sort of where the fear is controlled. So, you know, Dan handles a lot of horror films when, when they basically, uh, tease you with horror, it lights up and, and creates a lot of activity in the amygdala. And then um, you see the other structures around it. These are really important for the emotional impact of the story or the painting or the artwork that you've done. Then these, this system is also very important too, and this is the one I think it's gonna be crucial for understanding creativity. We now understand that there's something called cold and hot cognition. Uh, these are not the technical terms, but they're probably pretty useful to use these. If you look at the brain here, you'll see this brain has a little blue area. Can you guys make that out? That area is where most of the cold decisions are made. Now, what are the cold decisions? That's the sort of rational, reflective, um, logical thinking that happens when you have time to work it out. Let's say you're doing like a, a chess game. and You're trying to figure out your moves and so forth. Uh, that's usually gonna be your cold cognition system. Um, below that, though, and towards the front, is where a lot of the hot cognition happens. This is very fast. This is what you need when you're making decisions in real time. Like last night, if you're watching the ball game, and you see these guys batting, um, the ball is coming at them like 100 miles per hour. That's actually too fast for them to track. So instead, their brain has been trained to sort of get a sense of where the ball is gonna be way out there, like still many, many, you know, 10 feet away or whatever, and then they can swing accordingly. That's, be, that's all hot cognition stuff. They've trained like a set of heuristics to respond, and they're not, they don't have time uh, to think it through, and that part of the brain doesn't even, the dorsolateral cold decision doesn't even work fast enough. So this is gonna be important in ter certain kinds of creativity. When you improvise a lot, is it cold cognition or hot cognition? It's hot. I want to thank right? the school for uh, inviting us to put this together. Uh, this is really uh, pretty fantastic for me to be able to come here and uh, spend the evening with my brother talking to you guys uh, about what it is that we do. And, uh, and you know, there, there's a lot of gratitude to be able to kind of come here and talk about these things. Meaning, you know, the idea of being creative and the idea of being, uh, basically being paid to be creative is, uh, is pretty fantastic. And that's what you guys are all here as students kind of learning to develop into your creative selves, your best creative selves, which I think is, uh, is fantastic. And whether it's the science of it or whether kind of the practical application of it, um, uh, you know, the, the creative process is, is truly an exciting one. So, all right, so let's get in with it. Um, so to talk about brainstorming, um, I think it's trailers. Trailers are a very much a uh, kind of collaborative uh, uh, maybe a couple writers putting things together, but in truth, it's much more than that. It's actually a, uh, it's a whole team that comes together uh, to put together trailers uh, for movies or for broadcast, uh, for games. Um, and that kind of separation of powers is um, 
is pretty strong, meaning the fact that everyone has their own responsibility through that process. So um, you have an editor, you have a graphics designer, you have a writer, um, you have a producer. The producer's responsibility is to be able to kind of talk back and forth between the studio and the creative team. So um, uh, I think it's important to know that it's th this is about teamwork and team building because um, brainstorming doesn't just happen alone. It really happens with a group of people. So it's our responsibility as kind of team leaders to create the safest place um, that we can for people to brainstorm. Um, real brainstorming and good brainstorming comes from um, uh, a structure. A lot of people, it's true, the, the more that you can just kind of roll with things brainstorming, the better. But there has to be some theme, some basic theme that you start with or start from. So, and I'm going to give some examples of this. Um, uh, if you're involved in a kind of a creative project, right, and there are no limits, meaning it's just like, yeah, hey, you know, do whatever you want, it ultimately becomes very frustrating. It, you, you're spinning your wheels. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of this. The, we were working on, there's a new film uh, called Cure for Wellness by Gore Verbinski. He did The Ring and he did some other films. I'm sure some of you guys probably recognize the name. So we went to the studio and we, we were kind of, we were gonna have a creative meeting and talk to him about this. And uh, the takeaway from the meeting was do something great. Uh, do something that people are gonna be, you know, tweeting about tomorrow. Well, that's, uh, that doesn't help. Uh, you know, to some extent, it's actually really, really challenging and really frustrating. And it's like, well, uh, you know, you, we, we have to have some at least theme or structure to be working from when you're first brainstorming. Otherwise, you just spin your wheels and you really, uh, it becomes really unproductive. So, um, as I said, we do, uh, we do trailers, we do broadcast marketing, we do streaming marketing, we do um, uh, subscription marketing, meaning premium stuff like Netflix, HBO, et cetera, et cetera. We also do game marketing. So we were um, tasked uh, a couple of years ago um, to do uh, the trailer for this game called Far Cry, and it was called Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon, okay? So, and, and I don't know how many of you guys are gamers, um, but, okay, awesome. So I'm, I'm learning to become a gamer, which is actually uh, really fun. I, I, it is, it's actually pretty awesome. Uh, and as the technology gets stronger and the storytelling gets better, in many ways, I think the gaming community is starting to use, uh, usurp motion pictures as, as really strong entertainment. So anyway, this game, uh, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon, the whole thing takes place in the 80s, okay? So they said, we need you to come up with a trailer, or something really cool, really unique. So what we did was we went, we started with the main theme that we're in the 80s. Okay, so those, that's the structure that we're gonna stay within, okay? And what does that mean? Well, that means all sorts of things, meaning there's a very high cheese factor when it comes to the 80s, whether it be music, whether it be fashion, whether it be, you know, um, you know the movies that came out in the 80s. I mean, you're, you're s this stuff is not, was not that good, okay? <laughs> so, so, so let's embrace that with this trailer and let's really have fun with it. Uh, complete to, I mean, complete with, really over-the-top narration, uh, you know, over-the-top characters, um, just really pushing things um, so that it's, uh, uh, it, it really feels exaggerated. And I'm gonna show you guys the trailer for that. Welcome to the future. The year is 2007. Nuclear war has nearly destroyed our planet. Now, an evil presence seeks to enslave what's left of humanity. And there's only one thing that can stop it. Nobody threatens my planet. Michael Bean is Sergeant Rex Power Colt. A Mark IV Cyber Commando, who's part man, part machine, and all American. School's out forever. He's got the science. He's got the firepower. And he's got the Robo Balls. That's a Rex Code guarantee. 
destroyed. Evil is more hero than any man on earth. I know hero. Firemen, policemen, janitors. Those are the real heroes. He is Sergeant Rex. Power. Colt. And he's here to save the world. Far Cry 3. Holy shit. Blood Dragon. This standalone title is available now. Yeah, uh, even down to like the lines of resolution being all kind of like, yeah, it, it was, we were really having fun with that. But the reason why this worked was because of the fact that we were kind of going off of the structure of, okay, we're in the 80s. So how do we exaggerate that? How do we kind of, how do we embrace this kind of almost as a genre and really kind of push it and have fun? So, and there, and, and the brainstorming sessions for this were hysterical, I can, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine. So, um, so. Moving on, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, this process of trying to create a safe place for really good brainstorming. Um, uh, you know, I, I think very often what happens is everyone assumes, you know, you get a team together in a room and you start rolling off ideas and people are kind of taking notes, you know, and it's like, oh, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea. In truth, really, there are no bad ideas, meaning the fact that even a bad idea, idea can generate something uh, uh, much stronger. So, um, I, but I do, I, I want to kind of stress the fact that you should, and, and I would encourage you to let the freak flag fly. And what I mean is, even though it's good to have some type of structure when you're brainstorming, and this is either when you're kind of working with a group or working alone, um, you, you should go out there. You should really, really push it. Um, we find that we do this very often. Um, we, there, are, there are a number of uh, structures that we have to follow, but occasionally when we let it go, sometimes we, something kind of unique, well, and actually brilliant happens. So there is a, you know, I'm sure some of you guys have seen um, uh, kind of classic uh, uh, critic review. They call them critic review trailers, and that's where when you're watching it, uh, you've got a kind of a, a graphic comes up saying somebody who is kind of commenting on the movie saying like, you know, the best film of the year, four stars, you know, this is very, I'm, you guys have seen this. So we were asked to do this, a kind of a, just consider a classic uh, critic review spot for uh, the Muppets movie. And since the Muppets are by their nature kind of, you know, subversive, and that's kind of what makes their comedy really funny. I mean, I grew up with the Muppets, and I know there was a certain amount of kind of irreverence to them, which was, which I loved, given the fact that they were puppets. Um, we decided we were really going to kind of embrace this, uh, and, uh, and this trailer came from this. Critics across the internet are outraged that Muppets Most Wanted was not nominated for over 247 awards. Whoa. Oh no. That's terrible. Ah. Hot Fudge 1218 says Muppets should have been nominated Best Picture for reals. Then Baby Bean 1128 proclaimed it can't be. It's not out yet. You're ignorant. <gasps> so then Hot Fudge 1218 said, don't call me ignorant. You don't even know. Then Baby Bean 1128 replied, Good, I don't even wanna know. Ah! And then Rich Playa 33 raved, I made 2,000 bucks just sitting at home. Click this link to find out how. Well, he seems like a nice guy. Yeah. 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 Humble, yeah. honest. Mm -hmm. Muppets Most Wanted, finally eligible for nominations March 21st at theaters everywhere. Kissy, kissy. Rated ah! PG. Um, but I mean, look, I, I, I think that's an example of absolutely going off the wall. I mean, this has nothing to do with the Muppets. And it actually aired during the Golden Globes, which I think is fantastic. Um, so, but again, I, I think that's one out there. And, and when you've got the team and you've got people who are willing to take those chances, this is sometimes what happens. Uh, and, um, uh, 
And we were really surprised. We were super surprised Disney went ahead with, and, and went forward with this. Um, so uh, the, the other thing I want to kind of mention with regard to brainstorming, then I'm going to uh, hand it back off to Steve, is that there is in kind of the process of brainstorming, a, a lot of times you're looking at um, materials that are kind of subpar. That's why you're in a position, a creative position, like for, for, for our teams to be selling a movie uh, to make it seem better than it is. Um, and, and there are many, many challenges with that. Uh, and in fact, for those of you guys who have gone to see a trailer, you like the trailer, you think you're gonna go see the movie, and then the movie sucks. That's a perfect example of, of us doing our job, uh, but, but ultimately, you know, you're not being really happy about it. Um, but, and, and very often, we're asked to take bad movies and make them seem good. And, and that is, uh, and that can, that can certainly be challenging. However, there are other, other times where we're asked to take something good and make it great. Um, and that process is also kind of by its nature very challenging too, given the fact, like for instance, working on a movie like 300, right? Okay, for those of you guys who have seen 300, when you, know, w when you take that movie, if it's, a, if it's a bunch of, you take the shots of that movie as if it's a puzzle, and you throw them up in the air, and however they land, that's gonna be a great trailer, okay? And the reason for that is because, you know, every shot is a painting in that movie. Um, you know, the, the production value is such, you know, the sound design, things like, you know, the, the real craftsmanship of that film is, is, is very unique. So that's a process of brainstorming that, that it almost becomes, you have to get out of the way of it. Meaning the fact you just kind of let it happen. You, you as an editor, you cut, something on a movie like 300, you, you, you can't really do a bad job with something, with a movie that good. Um, but it, it's, it's understanding that you want to get out of the way of it versus, oh man, you know, I got to really crack this. I got to really figure out how to make this work. Sometimes it's better just to just let it roll over you and to figure out, hey, what is this, what, what's the simplest way to present this? Uh, and that, by, that is also, by its nature, a, a different kind of brainstorming. We, uh, one that I wish we could do more often, because uh, I wish we, we weren't as challenged with turning bad movies into good movies, but it is, it's still part of what we do. So anyway, I'm gonna hand it back over to Steve for a second. We won't have to open it up to full screen. Um, just uh, as Dan was showing you these cases of uh, brainstorming, uh, now I want to talk about this other phenomenon. We've sort of broken into these basic sort of ingredients for um, creativity. And this is to talk about cliches, good and bad. The, the mystical tradition about creativity is that you just get overtaken and the wonderful genius flows through you and you haven't uh, appealed to anything that went before you and so you would never use a cliche. The idea is the cliche is anathema to creativity. But anybody who really is creative and even works in the creative industry realizes that your cliches sometimes <laughs> are extremely valuable and you rely on them sometimes. You want to avoid bad cliches and try to use the good ones and that's sort of an interesting question, what's a good cliche and what's a bad one. Um, so Dan's going to show some examples of cliches, riffs, gags, cliffhangers. Um, the cliche is kind of recycling. You're going back to something that worked before and you're trying it again. Uh, and also the cliches are comfortable. So the audience and the creator oftentimes will rely on them. If they've taken you too far afield, they'll go to a cliche. This is true for any art form. Those of you, guys, those of you who improvise, and I know some of you guys improvise in here, uh, you, you basically have cliches that you go to uh, when you're stuck and you know these are gonna work and your other f improvisers know they're gonna work and the audience relates to them really well and then you start to step away again from the cliche. So, um, <laughs> Obviously, in the world of marketing, um, I mean, uh, cliches are, are just, they're everywhere. Um, and in fact, I, I, in, in many ways, that's kind of how we, um, that's the language that we use. Um, it is, I think in some ways, um, uh, I think Steve touched on this, cliches are comforting. They're kind of chicken soup, uh, meaning it's, it's what we expect. Um, and, and I think when you're trying to sell something, which is kind of what we're doing when we're uh, making trailers, we're selling the movie, the more that we can can't kind of have the audience feel safe um, and, and to expect uh, and, and to know what to expect, the better. 
That is certainly the case in most genres. It is not the case in horror. But, but I think it's our responsibility, and, and it's our responsibility because, well, let me, let me first say, it's our responsibility to get better in, in the work that we do, and that means finding better ways to be able to present what, what we know are cliches, and that's kind of the difference between bad and good cliches. You as audience members are getting more sophisticated. You guys are you guys have a film language. You guys understand film language. You guys you guys are developing it. You guys have developed it. So so the idea of being able to present to you just the same old thing isn't fair. Meaning it's not it's just not going to work. You guys aren't going to fall for it. You're going to be like, yeah, no, you're not getting my money, or I'm not getting that place, right? So, um, so I want to show you guys an example of kind of what I would argue to be a good cliche. Okay, we in marketing, um, I'm sure some of you guys are aware that there, there's a uh, there are visual and audio motifs. Um, uh, there's a convention, a big convention in in trailers and TV commercials where it's repeating things. Whether it's a breath, um, I, I, there's a number of great examples of this. Um, if any of you guys have seen the American Sniper uh, teaser, where it's just a, a heartbeat that's kind of building. Or that's breathing and, and it's getting faster and it's you know it's getting more intense. So these are these are audio motifs that are played and are played to manipulate you. Um, there are visual motifs too, um, where you, for instance, if you're uh, you're looking at like a trailer or a TV spot, you'll keep coming back to that same visual cue, but it's supposed to be either giving you new information or more information, or it's supposed to be kind of you know uh, building to something else. Um, so I'm going to give you, show you a quick 30 second spot of what I would argue to be uh, uh, taking a cliche uh, and making it far more effective. You listen good because I'm only going to say this once. I've known you a long time. I need to know exactly what you've talked to and exactly what you said. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Do you know what I do to Raz? Ah! I had no choice! You always have a choice. You just happen to make the wrong one. Rated R. The, the strength of that, uh, just as a, a simple 30 second TV commercial, is that it's, it's, it's called, the name of the spot is called Sit Ups. Obviously, it's Johnny Depp starting to sit ups in the very, very beginning, and it's threaded throughout the whole thing. Not only is it visually, visually doing uh, push-ups, excuse me, sit-ups, but also you're audibly hearing him do uh, sit-ups as well. So, and, and the goal, obviously rising action, as things get more dramatic, the, the, the sit-ups intensify, it's supposed to leave a kind of exhausted kind of feeling in the audience. To me, this actually works, um, and, uh, and I think it's an effective use of a cliche, both a visual and audio uh, uh, cliche. Um, okay, so obviously, um, I didn't bring any primarily because of the fact that I feel that most of you guys already understand the cliche of horror. Uh, I think it's just kind of part of, it's, it's kind of been burned into our psyches. We kind of understand um, uh, the cliches of horror. Uh, we understand the good ones, we understand the bad ones. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, and, and Buddha Jones as an agency did uh, a great deal of it in our early days, did, it, but did quite a bit of it within the horror genre. So that gave us a real opportunity to kind of explore uh, uh, how do you turn bad genre, excuse me, bad cliches into good cliches. And actually, what's interesting is, um, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was just Halloween just the other day. I mean, do we have any fans of the movie Halloween? So, I mean, we all know Halloween has become, kind of created its own kind of subgenre within horror. But, but the truth is, when you watch it, and if you watch it now, you know, you're, you're kind of, it, it, it's, it's nowhere near as satisfying as it used to be. And that's because of the fact that so many other films have kind of branched off from the cliches and have become cliches. Um, there, and, and what's interesting is, that for those of you guys who are, again, who are horror, horror fans, there was a movie called Black Christmas that basically Halloween took and made some adjustments, put a mask on a guy, made it so that the killer didn't die, and kind of created this whole new genre, okay? But it's still a cliche, and then from there, you take, what is Friday the 13th? It is basically, it's another guy in a mask, uh, hunting adolescents who are having sex, but, you know, instead of it being in a house, it's out at a teen camp. You know, and it just goes and goes and goes from there, and I'm sure you guys kind of all recognize and kind of can acknowledge 
um, how horror is really driven by cliches. And that's and, and trying to find new ways of doing and presenting this stuff is really where I again to go back to brainstorming for a second. How do you crack this stuff? How do you make it new? How do you keep it new? And how do you keep it exciting for, uh, uh, for audiences that continue to become more and more sophisticated? Um, so really quick, I'm going to keep going uh, just a little bit more into shapes. Um, because I've been showing you guys um, kind of examples of uh, uh, cliches in trailers or TV commercials. There are, there are also tra um, cliches in graphics, obviously. Um, so those of you, if there are any graphic designers here, or if there are any, any guys who are pursuing motion graphics, um, this is really, really important for you guys to consider. There, is, there are cliches um, throughout the graphic world. Uh, and, um, and it's unfortunate um, because there's, they're, they're really not true. There's the cliche that black and white is boring, okay? There's, it, it's just kind of old school, we don't want to see it. Okay, I'll give you an example, right? Black and white examples, if you can uh, to speak of Woody Allen, like, uh, I love Woody Allen, but most people are going to look at that and go, yeah, that's kind of boring uh, from a graphic sense, right? However, um, you know, the contrast to something like that is going to be Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, okay? Again, it's all black and white. It's really, really beautiful. It's really unique. It's very different, okay? So it's taking what everyone considers to be, oh, it's the cliche of black and white. God, do I really, do we really want to see this again? Yeah, we're going to show it to you again, and we're going to blow your minds, because this is, this is fantastic. And the, the opening credit sequence to this movie is uh, sublime, uh, as most of you guys who have seen it uh, uh, probably would admit. So, okay. Now, let's move on to, uh, how about a cliche of pink, what the color pink is graphically. Uh, most people think of pink, they think either, either for kids, or little kids, or they think little girls, right? Okay, so, um, let's take a look. Um, okay, here's an example of pink that is far from childish, far from something for little girls. Um, here's another example that goes directly at working against the cliche, mean girls, right? Okay. Uh, and probably an awesome example of working against the cliche, war dogs. Okay. Those of you guys have seen this movie, this is far from cute and, you know, and childish. So, you know, again, I just want to kind of touch on these are examples of kind of the, through the creative process, whether it be, you know, working in film, video, graphics, motion graphics, writing. Um, uh, one more th quick thing about writing, I want to give an example. We were doing, we were working on this, this movie called Scary Movie. Anybody, you guys familiar with that movie? Okay. So, what is Scary Movie? It is all about making fun of cliches. It's taking every horror cliche and making fun of it, and that's kind of what it's, that, that's its humor, that's what's really funny. So from a writing standpoint, our writing staff was trying to come up with great ways to sell this. Um, and they decided to do a triplet, okay? A triplet is a copy line that runs three times, right? So in order to be able to kind of go at the cliche of scary movie, which is making fun of scary movies, we thought it would be funny to make it about kind of like family instead of being horror, it's something family and heartfelt. <laughs> uh, and then the last line of copy would turn all of it on its head. Um, and they ended up with um, a copy line that said, it's about family. Uh, it's about romance. And then the last copy of mine was, it's about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, but, and which, is, which, is, which works so well when you're dealing with a film that is making fun of cliches. So it becomes kind of like, almost like self-reflexive. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it's also a good way to be able to have fun with something that I think a lot of us are starting to get tired of, which is making fun of cliches. You know, the airplane. You know, that whole Naked Gun, all of these movies and franchises that have made fun of cliches, um, uh, you know, I think it'd be better to start focusing on, like, coming up with good cliches. All right, back to you. That when you see that uh, Johnny Depp uh, sit-up scene, what if, if you think back to the brain slides I started out with, you'll see that, you know, you have this old brain, you have the limbic brain, you have the new brain. What happens is that when we see somebody who's experiencing duress or stress or pain, we now know, based on research from the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, that we have a kind of empathic system that mirrors what the other person's going through. So when you see somebody 
who, like if I poke you in the finger with a pin, there's sort of two parts of your brain that lights up. It's the front part of your brain and the back part of your brain. But if you just watch me get poked by a pin, one of those pain centers lights up in your brain. It's a kind of mirror neuron response. And what I think is sort of exciting about these trailers is that when you use things like breath, breathing hard or really fast, um, or repetition of a heartbeat, it's actually affecting you at a subconscious level because it's going sort of past your conscious brain to your limbic uh, brain and activating it. So I think that's kind of an exciting aspect of these kinds of, uh, these kinds yeah. of trailers. This is the trailer. We did a trailer for the second season of Bad Robot. Um, and I'm going to kind of take you guys through, I'm going to show it to you and then talk to you guys about how, what our goals were in dealing with a, a show that has become a bit of a phenomenon. Remember the night of the hack? Remember what happened to you? All I remember is I woke up three days later. And what happened in those three days? There hasn't been anything like this in the past. This is going to be affecting our economy in ways that are extraordinarily significant. The FBI announced today that Tyrell Wellick and F Society engaged in this attack. Now we're changing up the guard has begun. People everywhere came to support us. And right now, they need to know we haven't given up, that we meant what we said about changing the world. Round and round we go. You not knowing what you did or didn't do, our infinite loop of insanity. I will follow my dreams no matter what. I'm sorry, my dear. This is all in your head. <laughs> There's no order. There's no power. There's more work to be done. Our revolution needs a leader. Fans of the show here? Yeah? Really? Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, I, you know, I do, I think this is, this is one of these, these shows that have, have become, you know, very popular and I think kind of for the right reason and, I, and our goal was to be able to embrace what it is about this show that seems to be resonating um, uh, for the general public. So, but again, it continues to be kind of working within the restraint of speaking directly to the audience. This trailer is not made for, you know, the, the audience that's under 15. It's not made for the audience that's perhaps over 40. It's kind of going directly at the demographic that, that, that this show has seemingly been very appealing to. So I just want to take you through a couple quick points, which was our goal is to be able to communicate creatively within these constraints that control is an illusion. Okay, uh, uh, that's the core and the theme of this piece, which is also reflected in the main theme of the whole season of season two. Uh, firstly, we wanted to tease the aftermath of the F Society's act. You know what, I'm not gonna do this just because you got, there doesn't seem to be a big group here that knows the show, so I'm gonna go on to the next one. Authenticity, season one was such a massive hit because it really struck a chord with viewers. Uh, there was truly nothing like it on television. The show was darker and more, uh, and more subversive, but it was also incredibly authentic, down to coding they show on screen during the hacking scenes. We needed to keep that authenticity, which was kind of our goal with the character development in this piece. And lastly is the third section, which is third, just a taste. You want to give the audience just a taste. Again, that whole sense, look, we had the editor who actually cut this trailer um, actually got into hot water because of the fact that he posted it on Facebook and, and, and I think made some small comment about what was potentially coming up in season two. And USA, the network that does it, freaked out because they were like, oh my God, you c we have to be very careful with what we're allowing to the audience to know, what we're feeding out to the audience. So that's why it was very much just about giving just a little sense of what this show uh, is, uh, is, is what you're going to be in store for in season two. So anyway, and I will tell you, it's pretty amazing. So um, um, I think, oh, oh, a couple things I want to talk about um, with regard to the, uh, the, do you want to talk about the minefield of egos or do you want to? Okay, all right. So there are other constraints, political 
constraints is, is perhaps the best way to describe them when kind of working with creative teams and working within an industry that is very much um, uh, driven by ego. Uh, and, and I think it's, I think we should be able to kind of have these conversations. Um, uh, and, and the politics of either filmmaking or marketing. Uh, and, um, and they can be very challenging constraints. Um, uh, you know, in it, the, the movie business, and most particularly in marketing, uh, there, is, there is a lot of people who really think they're the smartest people in the room. Uh, there's a lot of egos that get thrown around, and there's a lot of navigating those egos. So, um, you know, I, I, there's a funny story. This, this is an example of, of somebody that you want to work with, or, or this is a good exchange, a good creative exchange with somebody who is in a kind of creative leadership position. So we were working on the Oliver Stone movie called W. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that. Um, um, it's all about George W. Bush. It's actually a really good film. Um, so we were working on the trailer for it, and you know he was, he was at the agency, and we were kind of going through and showing him these different sections and different parts of the trailer, kind of structures and this and that. And you know he's like, you know, he's watching it. And he finally gets up, and he goes, you know what? I don't know how you guys do what you do. I have to go edit a film. You just go take care of it. So, uh, and let me, honestly guys, that's the greatest experience you can possibly have when you're dealing with kind of, you know, a political machine. And the, um, the ability to, to create um, willfully, to, to, to get into that zone. Can you give me some advice on how to go from that into an area of dealing with the ego that you were talking about in terms of like specifically how to get from creating, teaching, and directing to handling administration? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I, you know, I think, um, uh, to me, I think it's, you know, I think your creativity really does boil down to, it's just your opinion. Meaning the fact that I think that what, what, what you, and, and what you share with people is your opinion. So you're sharing your creativity. Um, and, and I know that, um, and sometimes you're, sometimes people don't agree with your opinion, and therefore they're not gonna agree with your creativity. Like I, I it's interesting, like, you know, um, you know, we're, as a culture, we're so into kind of cool things. Well, it's because we're a very creative culture. I mean, there's just so much really awesome stuff out there uh, to kind of like soak in. So I, I, I found that, um, the more that you can share your opinion, ultimately your creativity, and but also be conscious and respectable to other people's creativity and opinion, the better things tend to work. I don't. Um, I'm going to generalize when I say this, but I do feel like the days are gone of like you know to be a good leader is to be forgive me an asshole. You know, I mean, really, like you know, and and, and certainly in the film business, there really is this sense of like, well, if I'm a director, I got to run the show. Man. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta run these people. I gotta make sure they all fall in the line. And the truth is that that's really old school. I, I don't feel that's really any. That, that's just not healthy creative leadership. It's not. I, I think it's about about allowing people the safety uh, and the freedom to be able to kind of you know uh, find their own voice in things, to shape it, and to and to find uh, find a way for it to work within what your opinion or your creativity is. And then take that and run with it. Um, you know, I think um, uh, an amazing resource for for really kind of evolved creativity is uh, the Pixar book called Creativity Inc. If any of you guys have read that, it's amazing because it really it really kind of goes into detail about how that company structured itself to embrace, support, and nurture strong creative work. And it's uh, it's it's I think become it's certainly become a bible for Buddha Jones. Uh, and I would, I would encourage you guys all to, to, to uh, crack it open. It's a great book. So. Yeah, this is something that I'd be curious to hear what Dan says because he's under much heavier time constraints than I am. If I do something, I can be like, oh, I, I'll put this aside for a month. But you guys actually have to meet these deadlines or you don't get paid. And when you're writing a book or you're making an album, you know, I guess you're making an album, you have studio time. But yeah, for me, there's a lot of time that I can give it to just percolate. What about in your case? Uh, yeah, it's, um, um, uh, we found that um, the deadlines are kind of what dictates uh, uh, 
how much we can creatively stretch our, our, our muscles, meaning the fact that it is, um, and, and that can be, uh, and that can be really difficult uh, because of the fact that you don't, you know, deadlines change. Um, very often we can be under, a, 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 you know, like let's say for instance to work on a trailer, um, we're given two weeks to kind of cut something and then we're kind of killing ourselves, doing our best to get it to deliver to the studio by that time. And then they call up and say, oh, you know what? The delivery has changed. Do you have another week? And, that, and then suddenly you're like, well, wait, now I've got to rethink everything. Is, was it as good as it could be? Uh, and then conversely, it, 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 you know, you're given two weeks and then a week, you're a week in, they're like, yeah, we need to see that tomorrow. And then you're like, mm, yeah, okay. So then it's like, okay, everybody order dinner and everyone call your family and let them know you'll be, <clears throat> you'll be home whenever. Um, and, and you do the best you possibly can within kind of that, that window. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the, the, the real freedom of time is fleeting. Um, and so we end up, um, and, and, and that's why in, in, in many ways, what ends up being finished um, is, is rarely the best work. You know, it's, it is whatever the timeline dictated. And when you hit that, when you, at that 11th hour, whatever it is, is what it's gonna be. Uh, and it's, and it's, very, it's very frustrating when you know it's capable of being so much more but you just got to get it through the pipeline. So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, one more thing on this. It, it, sometimes you put yourself under the duress that you don't have enough time, and that actually produces a kind of stre stress that, that is really creatively interesting. Like a lot of improvisers will do this where they, they won't even rehearse. Like they'll have a gig, and it'll be in front of a bunch of people, and they'll be like, they just trust their own instincts that when they're on stage together, it's gonna, it's gonna go well or it isn't, but th they, they sort of have matured enough that they're not over-preparing for things. Um, they're not, and that's, uh, you know, it's not really quite to the time point, but I think that's, time can be luxurious, but also when it's really short, like Dan was saying, it might produce some pretty, pretty great stuff too. One more question. So we have one right here. Oh, uh, hello. Um, so my question is, uh, um, how do you take uh, this idea that you have and you put it to paper, but how did then do you take it from paper and get it onto screen to clearly communicate what you have in your mind? Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, and I think it applies not just to from paper to screen, but um, uh, from, from head to paper too is, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's just the process of, of doing it over and over and over again and being able to kind of go to people that you trust, uh, whose opinion you trust, and, and using them as um, bounce boards. Like, it is, it's, it's impossible to work creatively, uh, at least for, in, in my industry, in a vacuum. You, you absolutely have to. I mean, for, you know, very often it was, it was considered that, you know, editors kind of work solo. They kind of do their thing, and then, you know, you they come out of the room, and they're like, here's the trailer. And it's just so not the case. Um, and, um, and, and a lot of that is because it really is a social process, meaning you have to, you get stuck all the time, and you're not gonna, and if you're not gonna get yourself out of it, and rarely do I get myself out of it, I have to go and knock on the door to, to another producer or another editor and say, will you look at this and tell me if this is working? If what is in my head is being communicated, because here's what's in my head. I can say it, but am I communicating it through what I'm creating, through what I'm, I'm building? And very often they will be, um, they'll be like, no, this isn't working, have you tried this? And so the, the key for me is to realize I'm not the smartest guy in the room. The key for me is to be open for ideas and to, to, to be willing to, change my, uh, uh, some of my ideas uh, to make them better. So, and I assume the same things for writing. Yeah, except I am the smartest guy in the room, so <laughs> I, I don't know, no, I'm kidding. But yeah, you, you're right, that's exactly right. I think what Dan said is right. You, you get some perspective from people you trust, it really breaks it open for you. Thank you so much, Dan and Stephen, for joining us. Let's give them all a round of applause. Follow up.
more questions. Have a great evening. All right, awesome.